So now we'll talk a bit about the, some distilled concepts of deep learning. So you've probably heard about artificial intelligence in the news recently. Uh, it's something society have been uh, fascinated by for centuries. And actually some of the machine learning algorithms in use today have been around for decades. So what is it that's happened now in the last few years that's so exciting and has led to such, uh, such breakthroughs in artificial intelligence? Uh, it's actually three, three key ingredients coming together at the same time. Uh, so the first ingredient is data. Uh, just the incredible amount of data that exists today, um, you know, mainly di digital data, and you can see it if you think about social media, how many billions of images are uploaded uh, all the time. So there's this incredible amount of data that we have now. Also, another ingredient is computational power. So, of course, our own computers are getting more powerful. Uh, we also realize that GPUs could be really useful for machine learning. And then within the last 10 years, there's been this uh, cloud computing revolution, uh, which democratized computational power uh, for everyone on the, on the planet. And then the final ingredient is algorithms. So as I said, many algorithms have been around for a while, uh, but there were some important tweaks that happened in the last few years um, that, made, uh, that made machine learning what it is today. So these three ingredients came together, and that has led to this breakthrough in, 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 in ML, in the, in the media, and, and in our lives. So now Tim, Tim will tell us a bit, some, a bit of some uh, more practical examples of that. Yeah, so um, I want to tell the story of Alex Krzyzewski. Alex Krzyzewski won the ImageNet competition in 2012. And the ImageNet competition is a bit like the Olympics of computer vision. Um, it's essentially a huge labeled data set, and this is what Tempest was saying before, D data is one of the, the three ingredients of AI. Um, and uh, it, I mean, in, in 2012, it, it, it had a thousand classes and, and millions of labeled images. And Alex Krzyzewski, for the first time, he used uh, his GPU, NVIDIA released an SDK called CUDA, which allowed software developers to write programs that would run on the GPU. And GPUs have thousands of processes in, so there are certain classes of tasks that GPUs can do many, many times faster. Um, and the other thing is uh, Alex Krzyzewski um, uh, put some algorithmic tweaks into his, his uh, he called this architecture AlexNet. Um, it was a convolutional neural network, and the problem with neural networks is they suffer from something called overfitting, which means they, you know, they have so many millions of parameters, they can learn the training data too tightly and not generalize to new previously unseen data. So Alex Krzyzewski put a new form of regularization into his model, and he also used a different activation function called ReLU, which made it um, converge significantly faster. Deep learning models have this propensity to overfit. And overfit means learning the training data perfectly, but not generalizing to new previously unseen data. But anyway, in 2012, this was a, a massive breakthrough in computer vision. And this is just one story. We see the same story in natural language processing and in speech recognition. There was a huge boom in AI starting from around 2011, 2012. Uh, so now I'll explain uh, briefly uh, what a neural network is. So here we're showing a really simple neural network that classifies images of cats and dogs. Now, a neural network is made up of these units called neurons, and each neuron is, is one of these nodes. And the neurons are connect, connected in layers, and each connection has a weight, which is just a numerical value. Uh, so before the neural network can be used, it has to be trained. And that involves presenting the neural network with plenty of examples of cats and dogs that have already been labeled as cats and dogs. And then uh, learning just involves tweaking those weights, uh, until uh, tweaking them iteratively until we settle on some final weights, and then the, neuron is, uh, the neural network is trained. So when it's time to use the neural network, you present it with an image of, say, a, say a dog, and information from that image, uh, which, is, which is pixels in the image, uh, propagates through the neural network from the input layers to the middle layers, and we're going to talk about the magic that happens in the middle layers, and then to the output layers. Uh, so 
this information, the, the pixels that come in are, are multiplied and summed and passed through lots of nonlinear non-linear functions um, as they pass through the network. Now, if the image presented is a dog and it has dog features or characteristics like a long snout and, and ears, then the weight will all contribute to the probability that this image is a dog. And these simple neural network architectures have been around for a while, but it is the uh, architectures with lots of layers in the, in the hidden layers in the middle that make these deep neural networks. One of the interesting things about deep learning is that it's a different class of learning algorithm to uh, classical machine learning algorithms. It's what's called representation learning. With classical machine learning algorithms, the data scientist had to do almost all of the work. The data scientist would have to create powerful features using feature engineering. And then the machine learning algorithm itself would just kind of weight those features together. It would solve an optimization problem and kind of weight those features together in quite a you know, simplistic way. Um, with deep learning, low-level features, mid-level features, and high-level features are learned as part of the training process. And this is something which is possible if you have very, very large amounts of data, which is something which is conducive to deep learning. So here's an example of, of what Tim was talking about there. Uh, this is a neural network that has been presented with, with human faces, and it's learning the features of what makes a human face. Uh, now, the uh, face is presented to the network and the early layers learn these low-level features like horizontal lines and vertical lines. And then the, the hidden layers in the middle layer, in the middle layers learn these slightly higher level features like maybe a whole nose and, and eyes. And then the final layers learn these much more high level features like a whole face. Um, now, traditionally in computer vision, it would have taken maybe a whole PhD or a whole career to specialize in image processing around identifying human faces. So you'd have to get the, the face perfectly um, aligned and not rotated. And once it was perfectly in the right spot, you'd have to look for facial markers and manually craft these features of what makes a human face. But the amazing thing about deep neural networks is that they learn automatically these representations of what makes the face. And that's what makes them so powerful. Exactly. I mean, coming back to our story of Alex Krzyzewski, one of the other you know, really powerful things about his architecture was there were no um, domain-specific feature hacks in there. Um, in previous entries to the ImageNet competition, you know, the, um, the algorithms actually were trained on particular classes, so how to recognize dogs in the images, for example. Um, there are two types of things going on with, with these convolutional neural networks. First of all, they're transforming the data out of the space domain because images are kind of difficult to deal with because they're sparse and, 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 and they're, you know, there are many different ways you can take photographs of something. Um, but, but, but also, as, as Tempest was saying, that they, they learn these representations as part of the training process. Another really cool thing about deep learning is that um, the, the functions or the models that you build are universal function approximators, which means they can map from anything to anything. And you can even um, learn interesting um, kind of patterns or structures in the data domain. So as I was just saying a second ago, um, for example, you can learn about temporal or spatial dependencies in the input data. So um, if you pass in an image, an image is, is a type of data um, a, type, a type of object, if you like, that has dependencies between the pixels. If you randomly shuffle the pixels in an image, all of the meaning of the image is lost. And neural networks can natively um, model these dependencies between the pixels. It's the same thing with natural language or, or sequence processing. These have local temporal dependencies in, in the input data. Neural networks can model those. And neural networks can have um, as many inputs and as many outputs as you want. Traditional machine learning algorithms um, were discriminative, which means less things go out than what came in. And, and they are quite simplistic in their predictive architectures, for example, Classical machine learning algorithms can do classification or regression, which means you're predicting either a category or a number. With neural networks, you can output anything. You can have so-called generative models, where you're actually predicting a, an image or, or, or you know, perhaps some, some natural language as an output. And you can even have multiple input branches and output branches. So one of the things that we want to get to here is that machine learning is becoming a form of software development. and 
machine learning models are composed from different components that are potentially written and trained by different people. Um, the problem is there's a, a dichotomy between the software engineering process and the machine learning process because data scientists have a completely different way of working. Data scientists tend to use Jupyter Notebooks, which means they have quite an iterative uh, way of, of development, and software engineers tend to use source control and they write unit tests and, and, and there's, there's an entirely different process. So harmonizing these two worlds is, is something that uh, we're going to cover in, in today's presentation. Here's an example of uh, building a new type of novel prediction architecture, but we want to try and make the intellectual leap and, and actually call this a new type of software. This is a piece of software which takes in an image as an input and as an output gives you a natural language description. This is a piece of software, first of all, which you couldn't write using lines of code. If you're a C Sharp or a Java developer, it doesn't matter how good you are, you couldn't write this using code. It's a very special piece of software. The other thing is this shows how um, even deep learning models and predictive architectures can be composable just like software because a software engineer, what, what, what he does or what she does is they compose together packages and components that have been written by other software engineers, they compose them together in a new way to create some new functionality. And that's exactly what's happened here with this predictive architecture. Um, we're taking a deep vision CNN encoder, convolutional neural network encoder, and we're taking the output and we're feeding it into a language generating recurrent neural network. Um, both of these models have been trained by different groups of people on different sets of data and we've composed them together to create a new piece of functionality. In the olden days, if you were doing computer vision, um, you'd be working on an, an entirely different set of tools and languages and frameworks than a person uh, doing language processing. So deep neural networks have this ability to kind of um, uniform, uh, un unify um, you know, uh, everything together. So it doesn't matter what you're working on, you're using the same tools. We call this software 2.0. Software 2.0 is a confection of data-generated code and code written the old-fashioned way, just writing you know, lines of C-sharp and Java. There are some features which are impossible to write with, with old-fashioned code. An example is in the new version of Microsoft Teams, there's a privacy option to blur the background. You press a button and the background blurs and it knows where you are and it knows where the background is. This is something which is very easy to do with a convolutional neural network, but impossible, very <laughs> nearly impossible to do with traditional lines of code. And there are many examples of features like this, which you, know, you, you just can't write using lines of code. So we're in this new um, kind of paradigm now where software is, is a mixture of old school software and new school software. There are some interesting kind of properties to this software 2.0, one of which is that it's computationally homogenous, which means a piece of software which is a neural network, you can randomly take away half of the uh, connections in that neural network, and the software will perform roughly the same function. It also has a predictable time and space complexity, and it can be baked into silicon, it's very composable and transferable, and in many cases it performs a function much better than you could perform or write code to perform, so it's, it's, it's quite interesting. So deep learning is very powerful and very useful, but it's not magic and it does have some limitations. So it's actually good at interpolating, but not extrapolating. Uh, so this, this is what this graph is showing uh, from uh, Trask et al. this year. And so what they did in this paper was they trained a deep neural network to predict a really, really simple fun function, which is just f of x equals x. And they, use the range from uh, minus five to five to train it on. Uh, and then they saw how well it would predict uh, um, f of x outside of that range. So, you know, from minus five down to minus 20. And this, what this graph is showing here is the error on that range. So the different colors are different uh, variations on the, on the network. And you can see the error just going up because the deep neural networks did not generalize beyond the range that they were trained on. Uh, so that's quite an interesting result to keep in mind. One of the things that people say to us quite often is, um, when should we use deep learning versus classical machine learning? And the obvious answer to that is when you have large volumes of data. One of the things that distinguishes deep learning models is that you can potentially have millions of parameters. In a classical machine learning model, you might only have one um, parameter that you're learning for every single feature in your data set. So there's, there's a huge kind of dichotomy there. 
um, the promise of deep learning is, is, as we were saying earlier, to be able to learn representations as part of the training process. And in order to do that, you need to have a lot of data. The other cool thing is the ability to deal with unstructured data natively, things like images and speech and language. And this is because of that ability we were saying before about um, deep learning can model uh, time and space dependencies natively, which means you can have end-to-end -end predictive architectures without having to do some of the data wrangling and, and, and feature transformation that, that we used to have to do before. This ability to create novel prediction architectures. So, you know, as we've kind of uh, motivated and demonstrated in this talk, Deep learning models are a lot like functions in software. The only difference is they're not functions you write using lines of code, they're functions that you generate using data. The other cool thing is, is this kind of composability and reusability of modules. So I, I can um, take a, a, you know, a vision model which has been trained by one group of people and I can compose it together with, with another model um, you know, which, which was trained by another group of people. And this consistency of approach across domains is, is really, really powerful because it simplifies the software engineering process. It kind of, it kind of uniform, um, it gives us a uniformity um, in, in, in software engineering. And there are also some cases where you might not use deep learning. Uh, for example, when interpretability is important. Uh, for example, in the financial services industry, if you use a deep neural network to decide whether to give someone a loan and they question why they did not get a loan, it would be difficult to point to the exact features of their application that got them rejected. And there is some really promising and interesting research into this area of making deep neural networks more interpretable and transparent, but out of the box you don't get that interpretability. Uh, you also, uh, if, you, if your data is very small, then you, the deep neural network would just not be able to learn uh, any patterns from it, and in that case it would perform just as well as classical machine learning. Uh, you wouldn't get this representation learning. And then you wouldn't use deep learning if you need statistical guarantees, so like confidence intervals. Machine learning models are becoming ubiquitous in software. Um, I gave the example before of Microsoft Teams where you know, there's the ability to blur the background. Um, but the truth is machine learning models are being used everywhere in software. I'm sure you've used your favorite search engine or your favorite shopping application, and it seems to know what you're looking for before you even start typing anything into the search box. And the reason for that is because increasingly the software is data driven. It's learning local colloquialisms, it's learning things that are interesting in your local area, and it's personalizing its service to you because it has a stream of um, attention metadata of things that you've been looking at, things that you're interested in. And this is something that we see um, across the board essentially, that software in the future will be comprised of um, functionality which is generated from data and indeed functionality which is, uh, which is written using, using lines of code. And Tim and I work with all kinds of companies across different industries and we've seen more and more of them becoming data driven. So they used to have some, some product which was their primary product and they are becoming data companies. Um, and this is not just in, in the private sector, you also see this in government departments and charities and NGOs too. Uh, so these, are, these organizations are diversifying and creating new products and services from their data and finding uh, new revenue streams, of course, and, and new ways to serve their users and their customers. Uh, so two recent examples of, of, of this, where a company had some, some data and, ha and found a way to repurpose it uh, and find something uh, new, uh, just like Confuse.com, which we'll speak about shortly. Uh, the one example is uh, Ordnance Survey, this is Britain's map making agency. And they have loads of aerial data of the UK, so uh, images and, and other kind of spectral data are taken from aeroplanes, and obviously they use this to make their maps, which is their primary, primary goal. Uh, but they realized that they could use, um, they could use deep learning uh, to, to identify the buildings in the aerial images. So identify and then classify what each type of building is. So we, we collaborated with them to build this model. And the type of building is really valuable for, for building insurers. Uh, so that was a really interesting project. And then another one from earlier this year was working with a, a company that stores and manages hospital records. And they, they they store the records for millions of, of patients across Europe and 
primarily that's what they were doing for, for, for decades. Uh, but they realized that they could uh, do something really valuable with this data. So we helped them uh, build a machine learning model to predict how long patients would stay in the hospital for. Uh, so they built out this new service for hospitals to help them predict demand in the hospital. And that's really valuable for hospitals to, to kind of plan and, and be more efficient. Yeah, this is really something that we're starting to see across the board with so many of our customers here at Microsoft. I mean, another example is we, uh, we were talking to a global news organization the other week, and um, they're telling us about their journey uh, to becoming a data company. At the moment, they're a kind of value-add journalism company, and they are building products, sophisticated products, from their data and um, they're creating um, new services which they are selling to third parties, like for example insurance companies. And this is um, a pattern really that, that we're seeing um, across the board. Mm.